We're continuing on with a series on questions we have for God. Kind of going under the premise of if we can have a sit down, a Q&A session with God, and he said, ask me anything, I'll give you the answer. I'll, I'll, I'll answer you. Excuse me, I'll answer your question. So we're continuing on. My, the question this, this morning is, why don't we see the miracles today like we read about in the Bible? Where are those biblical miracles? What are, we, what are we missing? Why aren't we seeing those? So I want to read from Acts 28, verse 1 through 10. Once safely ashore, we found out that on the island that they landed, it was called Malta. I want to, I want to add, I want to go back. This is Luke talking. Luke wrote Acts. Um, they're actually supposed to be one and two, but they're separated in the Bible. But I just want to say Luke is talking here. Once safely ashore, we found out that the island was called Malta. The islanders showed us an unusual kindness. They built a fire and welcomed us all there because it was raining and cold. Paul gathered up a pile of brushwood, and as he put it on the fire, a viper, driven out by the heat, fastened itself and on his hand. When the islanders saw the snake hanging from his hand, they said to each other, This man must be a murderer. For though he escaped the sea, the goddess Justice has not allowed him to live. But Paul shook the snake off into the fire and suffered no ill effects. The people expected him to swell up and suddenly fall dead, but after waiting a long time and seeing nothing unusual happen to him, they changed their minds and they said he was a god. There was an estate nearby that belonged to Publius, the chief official of the island. He welcomed us to his home and showed us generous hospitality for three days. His father was sick in bed, suffering from fever and dysentery. Paul went in to see him, and after prayer, placed his hands on him and healed him. When this had happened, the rest of the sick on the island came and were cured. They honored us in many ways, and when we were ready to sail, they furnished us with the supplies that we needed. This is a reading of God's Word. <clears throat> I realize that the question for this morning that we have for God that we're going to explore is, is kind of like a part two of the question for last week. Last week we asked the question, why does it seem that you bless some more and bless some less? Last Sunday I talked about my cousin and his current condition, his current struggles with brain cancer. So my question I want to know is, why don't we see miracles today like we've read about in the Bible? It would be cool to have a man like the Apostle Paul stop by my cousin's bedside and Pray over him and heal him. And also, there's, there's a part two of this question. How come there aren't any believable miracle workers out there working for the Lord? I kind of came up with this question myself. I want, This is my question. Call me a skeptic, but I want to know. I just don't see that I can believe the Benny Hins of the world that wave their hands in the air and swing their jacket around and Twelve people fall over laughing, giggling, and they're all perfectly cured. I want to believe. I really do. But then again, I did say I was a skeptic. I really want Benny miracles, Benny Hinn's miracles to be real. And I know in my heart that God could work that way if he could. Just maybe, though, it's my uber-conservative skeptical Hollander in me. I don't know, but... I just can't accept people on TV dishing out miracles. There's just too many variables for me that I can come up with. I mean, it'd be really cool if it was real. I want to say that again. I believe that God can work through people. I really do, but at the same time, I just can't buy it. It would be great for all these people that are trying to cure cancer to be able to stop and say, wait a minute, let's just pray over this Petri dish and see what the cells do. Oh. Cancer's gone. Okay, let's go to human trials now. We're going to pray over here at the human trials. Oh, cancer's gone. That'd be phenomenal. My stepdaughter does that. She's a research manager now at St. Jude's Hospital in Detroit. Is it St. Jude's or St. John's? St. Joseph's. St. Joseph. <laughs> it's a saint. And it starts with a J. And it starts with a J. But, you know, that'd be so cool if Nicole could go, wait a minute. My stepdad's a pastor. He says, burn over it. Let's try this. You know, why don't we see that anymore? Why can't we see that anymore? That's my question for today. Where did the biblical ability 
to perform miracles go. And when I say biblical ability, we don't see people like Paul, you know? And why isn't there any believable or properly functioning miracle workers out there? Now, this may not be your question. Like I said, this is my question. But, you know, this is what, what I kind of want to know. I was led to this scripture reading in Acts. I was led to the Acts 28. The Apostle Paul is actually credited with delivering six miracles in his ministry. Six miracles. We don't hear a lot about them because Paul is busy writing letters and teaching. You read about most of them in the book of Acts. Why did I pick these two? Because as far as I can find with my research, these two miracles in the second chapter of Acts are the last two official miracles recorded in the Bible. In the biblical story. Paul was on a boat ride to Rome at this time. He was one of several prisoners en route to Rome. Luke was with him. And they were on a prison ship. He had been on trial just previously before Governor Festus and King Agrippa and Caesarea. Caesarea. Right, will you show the map, please? They couldn't figure out what to do with Paul, so they sent him to Rome. I don't know what to do with you. Go talk to Caesar. So they left Caesarea. There, I said it fine. I said it better this time. They went all the way over here underneath Paul is actually was born in this area, around Crete, and this little this little loop here is, is to show that that's the storm that kicked up. Um, there was a storm in the, in the Mediterranean Sea, the Great Sea, whatever you want to call it. In the Bible, it's called the Adriatic Sea, but it's the Mediterranean, and they ended up all the way over here on the island of Malta, just below Sicily. He was going to see Caesar, and they were on a 14-day tour via prison transport, like I said. This big storm kicked up. It's a great story. If you read in chapters 27 and 26, Paul stands up and says, Guys, be, no, don't worry. God's got this. Paul's preaching to the people on a prison ship. In the middle of the ocean, in the middle of the storm. They're throwing stuff over. They're throwing anchors over to keep from singing. And Paul standing up saying, Don't worry. God's got it. Don't worry. It's pretty interesting. They finally run around on the island of Malta. Cold, wet, and thankful to be alive after the SS Minnow, as I call it, ran aground. The castaways began making fires with the assistance of the Maltese Islanders. It says Paul was afloat in the ocean for a while on the wreckage. They were, they were pretty tired of being cold and wet, so they started a fire. Paul went around as helpful as Paul can be. Paul has always said, you know, work for your way. He's never been one to lay back. He begins picking up stones or sticks and brush to start a fire. Happened to be one of those sticks was a viper or a snake. Today on the island of Malta, there are no poisonous snakes to be found anymore. I have friends that currently live there. I checked with them. He says, yes, there are snakes, but not one of them is poisonous. This thing was, could or could not have been poisonous, but it was mean. It was a stubborn bugger. Luke writes that in the book of Acts, as Paul picked it up, it latched onto his hand and hung onto his arm. Poisonous or not, I'm sure it hurt. Luke, as we know, is a stickler for making sure all the facts were there from all the witnesses that that were there. And of course, Luke was there, so we know he was right. In verses 4 through 7, we see how these Maltese people were very superstitious. Nobody had, nobody had preached to this island before. They were part of the Phoenician nation, and they were all very superstitious. They all had multiple gods. They all had a god for a reason. They believed Paul, who was probably still in chains, was probably a murderer, because this viper was sent by the goddess Justice to kill him. But he didn't die. He didn't swell up. The, the, the passage says they waited for him to swell up and die. They watched for him or get sick. Nothing happened. Paul just shakes the thing off his arm into the fire as it were nothing. Even though this is pretty miraculous that Paul didn't die, I, I like to think of this as, as the, one of the minor miracles. This is important, though, that God used this miracle because now these Maltese people take notice of Paul as a VIP. He's a very important preacher. 
These people now thought he was a god. They said that. They said they waited after a long time, and now they thought of him as a god. I'm told that, my friends in Malta, if you go there now, everything is named after St. Paul. The island of Malta loves St. Paul. God works in mysterious ways, right? He takes Paul, the apostle, he puts him on a boat going to Rome to go visit Caesar before he goes to prison. He ends up shipwrecked on the island of Malta. He gets chewed on the arm by a snake, doesn't die. Why does he do this? It's like Paul was jumping out of the frying pan into the fire. God is working miracles here, though. Believe me. In this series of events, it starts off a three-day stay or a three-month stay for Paul. This happens all just before the winter season comes in, and it's different winter season than here. There's not a lot of snow, but the ocean in that part of the area in that time of year gets very unsailable, to say the least. So they wreck on the island. They're not going to go anywhere. So Paul gets to stay there for three months to preach to the Maltese people. God wrecks him on an island so he can preach to them. So after they were shipwrecked on a beach, which is now called St. Paul's Beach, on a small island, which is called St. Paul's Island, the Maltese people take care of the company of men that Paul was traveling with. There are two miracles that happen in this story. This is the first. God saves Paul's life and his traveling companions from the ocean and sets them up on an island where these people start looking up to Paul as God. They start respecting him. When these type of things happen to us today, we tend not to call them miracles, though. Sometimes we call it luck. Sometimes we call it blessings, getting blessed. And yet we still ask, where are the miracle workers, God? Who can help me out of this mess? We need to be careful when asking God for a miracle worker. When we ask God for a miracle worker, it takes our focus away from the one person that we should be focusing on. That's God. God's the only miracle worker we need. While Paul was still on this island during this three-month stay, he and his companion Luke were invited to stay at the governor of Malta's house. This man was called Publius. And today, if you want to go see Publius' house, go see St. Paul's Basilica. Apparently, they built it right there where the house was at. This was, again, a miracle from God. This guy didn't know God. This guy wasn't a Christian. He, there's no evidence to say that Publius was a believer or had even heard the message yet. But this was another miracle from God because his only other option was to stay in a dungeon somewhere in the local jail. But the governor of Malta takes him up, takes him in his house, has him live with him for a while while he's staying there. It just so happened to me that the governor's father was suffering from fever and dysentery. If you're not familiar with dysentery, dysentery is a bad infection that causes bad diarrhea. It's not a good thing to have ever. Paul goes in, prays over him, lays his hands on him. Of course, God heals the man. Then all of a sudden, the rest of the island of Malta, see, Paul can bring miracles to this island. And it says that the rest of the sick on the island were brought to Paul. And they were healed as well. That's the second big miracle in this story. After this, everyone on the island saw Paul as a VIP, as an important person. And they took care of Paul and Luke and those traveling with him, even making sure that they had everything they needed for the journey, to make sure they had all the supplies they ever needed to go from Malta up to Rome. This miracle story shows how God takes care of those who look for him, for those who seek him, for those who focus on him. Paul sought God in everything that he did, and Paul had the faith he needed to call upon the Lord, to call upon them in time of need. Even when they were in the storm, Paul called upon God. And this miracle, though, is this really the last miracle that we see delivered through human hands? 
We can't really be sure. Like I said, I see him on TV and I'm skeptical. I don't know if it's real or not. The biblical accounts from the early church kind of stop there in the end of Acts. After Acts, we have the epistles and the letters that Paul and James and John wrote and everything. And then the revelation of John. But just because the book ends there doesn't mean the story ends there. And God writes a story totally different from everyone else. The greatest miracle ever told comes from Luke chapter 24. On the very first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took spices. They had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, and when they entered, they did not find the body of Jesus. There were two men standing out there in white clothes. The Son of Man must be delivered, it says, to be delivered over the hands of the sinners and be crucified. And on the third day, as the old saying goes, Jesus is risen. He's risen indeed. If we were to ask God, why don't we see miracles performed like they used to be in the Bible? I would like to think he points us to the resurrection story all the time. In Luke 24. And this miracle is a miracle that happens every day. When we look at the resurrection of Jesus, we can understand that his victory over the grave is the only miracle ever needed to truly cure the world from disease and brokenness and death every day. When we focus on Jesus on the cross and the salvation we receive from it, we don't need to worry about being sick. We don't need to worry about the next greatest miracle worker coming into town. We have one in Jesus Christ. Jesus cures all things every day. Now some people will say, well, that doesn't take care of my cancer. Or I'm still fighting with bad arthritis. Or I'm still stuck in my wheelchair. And they'd be right. They still have cancer. They still have arthritis. They're still fighting in their wheelchair. But having a relationship with Jesus Christ means that everyone can know peace in spite of it all every day. Amen. And Paul's closing remarks to the Philippians, look what he tells them. These verses show peace. Rejoice in the Lord always, Paul says to them. I will say it again, Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. That peace. We can know peace in spite of everything that we're suffering from. And in the book of James, in the first chapter, he says that we need to consider it all joy when we go through perseverance of all kinds, through trials and temptations, when we deal with struggles in our lives, because that perseverance that we have will give us the wisdom to ask God for wisdom and protection. That peace we'll have when we have that relationship. The key is having a relationship when we talk to God. The one thing on, that the TV healers can't bring is relationship with God. They can point us that direction. The good ones know how to preach the gospel and to point us in that direction. But they can't form a relationship that we need. We have to do that ourselves. We can't do that by some guy waving his jacket in the air and healing somebody in a wheelchair. We have to have that faith. We have to have that ability to talk to somebody. Remember how many times Jesus said when he healed them, 36 to 37 miracles of Jesus are recorded in the Bible. How many times he said, rise up, your faith has healed you. Mm -hmm. Miracles run the risk of taking away the relationship and replacing it with instant gratification. Mm -hmm. Humans can easily forget where the miracle, the blessing is coming from. You know, when I was interning in prison, we had a great, great guy give a testimony on gratification, where our blessings come from. He asked us one day, he says, before you sit down and eat your meal, how many of you pray and thank God for your meal? Oh yeah, we all do. 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 
Yeah, we all do. And he said, great, that's good. Okay, now when you're done eating your meal, how many of you thank God for the meal afterwards? We were, oh, oh. We had a lot of people hanging their heads. We, we couldn't answer yes because we were instantly gratified. We, we, we were reminded that sometimes we forget to thank God after the meal too because we got what we wanted. We couldn't answer yes, and, and that reminds us that when we want that instant miracle gratification, that we could get it, but will we remember where it came from? Yes. The point I'm trying to make here is that miracles can be taken for granted. Mm -hmm. Miracles can be taken for granted. Jesus healed several, uh, several people with leprosy, and only one came back to thank him. Miracles can be taken for granted. Since Jesus performed the greatest miracle ever, defeating death on the cross and the prison of hell, no other miracle is significant enough or powerful enough. We have the only miracle we need right here in our hearts every day. It's our salvation. We don't need someone making mud and putting it on our eyes because we have the vision inside us already from the Holy Spirit. I have to be careful, though. I don't want to preach against miracles and the possibility of miracles. God does answer prayer. Jesus says if we have faith and we ask him, he will give it to us. We'll receive it because God is in control. A few weeks ago, we prayed for baby Libel, Josh and Brittany's baby, because they had an irregular heartbeat. And last week, Brittany told us all that the heartbeat cleared itself up. But we know better. We know what was behind that miracle. We know it wasn't nothing the baby could do or the doctors could do or Brittany or Josh could do. We know it was the power of God's power through prayer and healing. Mm -hmm. All we had to do was just have the faith to pray and ask. We can still see the biblical style of miracles in each and every one of us because of the death of Jesus Christ on the cross and the resurrection of the grave. And then we can go spread that miracle to others when we go spread the good news of the gospel. Mm -hmm. We can thank God for his miraculous power that's still very evident today inside each and every one of us. Amen. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you. Thank you for the miracle of salvation. Thank you for blessing us with the ability to lean on you, to listen for you, to pray with you, and to, to accept a miracle in our lives. We know that sometimes those prayers don't get answered in our time, and we, we just ask to always remind us that it's your time because you're in the control. The miracles might not come that way, but we know that your love is always there for us. Thank you for that. Help us to go out and show others that your love is always for them as well. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen.